Okay, we'll go ahead and get started um, in the interest of time as people sort of filter in. Um, I'm very happy to uh, have this panel here with me. It's, uh, it's a very large and distinguished panel, actually, so um, hopefully we can address a lot of things that are very near and dear to your hearts, uh, particularly with regard to um, uh, regulation and potential policy frameworks that are being discussed with regard to offshore drilling. Um, I will, in the interest of time, just introduce my, my panelists up here. Um, and tell you what they do. I'm not going to read their bios. You guys can do that. You have the, that information all in your, in your um, uh, programs. But sitting immediately uh, to my left is Carol Dinkin. She's a partner at Vincent and Elkins. Um, uh, next over is Russell Gold. He's an energy reporter and editor for the Wall Street Journal. Um, then we have Karen uh, Alderman Harbert. She's the president and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Institute for the 21st Century Energy. Um, then Shirley Neff, <coughs> excuse me, uh, senior analyst of the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill and Offshore Drilling. Uh, and finally, Chris Van Orsdale, he's a senior policy analyst and government affairs manager uh, for the Gulf Restoration Program of Ocean Conservancy. Um, so the way this will work is I actually have several questions I'm going to ask each of the panelists to address, uh, but then we'll open the floor to uh, each of you. Um, but the way we'll do it is you will not come to a microphone and ask, there's actually a card uh, in your seat. I'd like you to, if you have a question for one of the panelists or all of the panelists, uh, to write your question down and that will actually be brought forward to me so I can, I can ask the question of the panelists. So uh, with that, um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and we'll start with you, Carol. Um, and certainly this is a very broad question, so feel free to answer it uh, as broadly as you like because we will drill down. Um, the first really burning question I think on everybody's minds and uh, quite frankly, uh, we heard in the, in the morning session, Dr. Thornhill mentioned that uh, you know, the safety of, of the ecology of the Gulf of Mexico is certainly something that is more in public awareness now. And so you have to ask the question, uh, how do we ensure the safety of our coastlines and coastal economies? And can it be done without sacrificing the benefits of increasing offshore oil production to our energy security? Yes, I think it can be. And I think that the way to assure the ecology and the health of the Gulf is to assure that the operations in the Gulf are well managed, well planned, well implemented. And I think that industry is very capable of doing all of those things and has done them very well for a very long time. And I think that having a system with objectives with performance standards and that is developed collaboratively between the regulators and the industry is what is needed. Russell? Well, I, I think the jury's still a little bit out because I don't think we have really fully understood yet um, what the risk profile is for deep water drilling. It's such a new uh, endeavor and uh, one of the things that we reported quite a lot uh, was the whole question of how many wells have been drilled. Well, we know how many wells have been drilled in 5,000 plus feet water, but is the risk one in 30 or 40,000, the number of wells that have been drilled in deep water, or was Macondo something different? And is the risk substantially higher? And there's been a number of uh, engineers who've made that argument. So. I think until we have a better understanding of what the risks are with deep water drilling, especially in, in, in the type of, of high pressure reservoirs that we saw, I don't think we really are going to have a good answer yet as to whether we can do it uh, in a repeatable, safe manner. Um, and therefore, it's an open question as to whether the, the economy and, and the ecology, the environment of the Gulf of Mexico will be sustained over the long term. I think my answer might be a little different. I think the answer is, is we have to. We have to figure this out because you looked at what, you know, the charts that were put up uh, by Robin earlier and that 7% uh, of the world's oil reserves is what our multinationals have access to. That means that over 90% are owned by state-owned oil companies or countries that don't necessarily have our best interests. And so we have to become more self-reliant. So we have to figure this out. We've got 250 million cars on the road in the United States. 
and 4% of those that were sold last year were of the alternative or hybrid variety. So we're not changing this dramatically overnight. There's a sustained demand for fossil fuels, and are we going to produce more of those at home and hopefully have the highest environmental standards possible in the world so we can produce them safely here? So I think the answer is we have to, and we have to involve everybody so that we've got the public confidence that we can move forward in a responsible way. Thank you. Uh, first, I have to say that I'm speaking on behalf of myself, not the commission or the federal government. I am a federal employee. Um, having said that, I did spend the last six or eight months uh, working for the commission and looking at this pretty closely. Um, first, I want to say that what the commission did conclude is that there's no reason for us not to continue with offshore development in the Gulf of Mexico. What the Commission's report has concluded, and there's extensive discussion of this throughout uh, different parts of the report, is that we need to take a proactive risk-based approach um, to regulating and overseeing these activities in the offshore. Um, the overall conclusion, I think, of the report that's been widely reported is that there were management failures here, that there was a reliance on, you know, previous experience with technology, and there's always the danger of a certain amount of complacency, or as another regulator has pointed out, you know, the, the, when you become used to doing things, you forget to be afraid, you forget to be focused, and so what we need to do now is to really focus on the areas, well, we need to focus on the risks of specific incidents, specific activities, I should say. And one of the main recommendations the commission came out with, and I think um, this is sort of the, the template that uh, Director Bromwich will speak to later, is the notion that you have to have a competent regulator with engineers and staff on the technical safety side who understand what's going on, how things have evolved, understand the specific circumstances and risks of a, of a certain permit application. You know, the Macondo well was more complex than, say, others that may have, have come through the office. And so if we do that and we have the sort of office, the sort of regulatory culture that interacts with the, the industry relative to the risks and the type of activity that it's presented with, then we'll have more confidence from the, the public standpoint that we have an, an overseer and we have an industry that's being properly challenged and is responding accordingly uh, to address whatever risks may, well, there, there are certainly risks, but to address and manage those risks as they arise. And, and my response to that um, would, would be much along the lines of my, my panelists here. I, I absolutely think it's, it's, we have to have a solution. Um, the people of the Northern Gulf, oil and gas and fishing are directly interdependent. Um, in Louisiana, it is not uncommon for a fisherman to work for two weeks and then go onto a rig. Um, it is in many ways part of the cultural identity of the Gulf. Fishing, oil and gas, our maritime commerce, all those elements are pieces of what makes the Gulf great. Um, that said, we absolutely, as we move into deeper wells, as we move offshore, um, what Macondo did, which is exactly the same as what happened to us on the back end of Katrina, is it exposed a need for change. It exposed a need for better oversight, more transparency, and a much more clean look at front end planning, preparedness, response of all the people in the chain. Um, I think that the task force, um, the Oil Spill Commission and others have done great first steps. I think it's just gonna lead into ensuring that we continue to, to look towards doing that and by what I've been able to see so far is from our communities, our local municipal, state, federal leaders, it seems like we're all pulling in that direction to get it done but I think it's gonna take oversight and responsibility to get, make sure we do that properly. Okay, um, so from each of you basically I've heard um, we have to, right? Um, which I think is widely recognized. Um, but I've also heard that there's a need for change. And so what I'd like for each to address is, is what manner of change do you think would be acceptable? Um, not only by industry, but also by the public. Because I think in this case, we have to have buy-in from, from all parties interested. Yes, I think that what we need to look at is how, 
as I said earlier, do we have a collaborative process between the regulators who provide the oversight and the industry that works offshore? And I would suggest that the responsible care program that the American chemical industry put in place over 20 years ago would be a very good model for what we need in the Gulf of Mexico. And that is a model where industry has come together and voluntarily have developed processes and systems. And they have made sure that those are transparent with the regulators, but more importantly, with the communities that they work in. And they have independent third-party verification. I also think that we need to look to industry to be more vigorous in terms of being prepared in the event of a major accident. And we see with, with what ExxonMobil spearheaded in terms of um, a, an industry consortium to do that, an excellent approach. That sort of thing was, was done years ago with the Marine Spill Response Corporation, but I think its funding fell by the way. What we need is to make sure that, that the public supports that voluntary industry response organization and that industry itself is vigorous in, in developing and putting it into place. Well, I'm going to take a little bit of a different um, uh, slant on this, mostly because it's my job to be asking my fellow um, panelists about this question instead of offering my opinion. But I did want to point out, because I think it's important when you talk about change, that that these questions are not being asked in a static environment. Just this week in Houston, there was the Offshore Technology Arctic Conference. Um, I, I didn't attend, but from what I gather, it was well attended. The companies that have been involved in the Gulf of Mexico are very interested in pushing to the Arctic, which has a whole new set of challenges, um, much shallower, lower p pressure, but good luck finding spilled oil and, and, and ice. Um, and I think we just need to, to, to realize and address that the questions that are being asked are not being asked in a static environment, that the, the industry is constantly evolving and changing. And by the time in two or three years when I think all these questions will be answered, the industry is going to be, uh, is already off into Greenland and, and Arctic, uh, Alaska and the Beaufort Sea. So we need to be aware of that. You know, maybe I'll also take a different tact. Um, we live in a time where this is, this is perceived as a very adversarial relationship. Uh, when you have people in very high places of power in our country demonizing the industry and calling them out as, you know, yesterday's energy and dirty fuels and hauling up uh, CEOs in front of Congress and berating people, uh, that leads to the public saying, well, yeah, that must be true then. Uh, and you know we've got to lay down our spears here if we have to make it work by calling each other names all the time. You know we go back to what you said about you know kids in the in the classroom. This is about you know we look like two bullies. Uh, you know I think we need to lay that down and have a much more adult conversation because we have to. Uh, we're going to need these fuels, and so we need to have a much better understanding uh, of, of how each other can work together. I think it's very incumbent upon the industry to be a lot more transparent. You know, you look at what's happened since Macondo and the hundreds of millions of dollars that they have invested because they have recognized there were weaknesses. They need to come forward and elaborate on that to instill some public confidence. But we do need sort of that good housekeeping seal of approval from the government because if uh, Exxon or Chevron or whoever comes forward and say, we're the best, it's, it's hard for people to believe that. Uh, and so I think there needs to be a recognition that everybody has to realize the amount of technological advancement that is being made, that will be made, and that should be made. It's not a static environment. Uh, technology will be needed to go into the Arctic. And the companies have every incentive in the world to develop that technology if they want to be there. Uh, so I think it's, about, it's a time to take a breath, lay down the spears, be adults about it, uh, and come forward so that people have a better appreciation about the need for it and the, the advancements that have been made. Well, I guess my response will be rather predictable now. Um, everything Karen said about the industry is true. There's been an awful lot of hyperbole. I think the same is true about the government and the agency, and I want to stand up for the career employees of, of this agency. 
I uh, worked for the Senate, worked for Senator Bennett Johnston from Louisiana back in the 90s, and have had a lot of experience interacting with MMS and, and current staff there now. And I can tell you that one of the challenges, and Karen and I were talking about this before this panel, is to ensure that when you have an agency charged with the, the public trust here, and especially the, the Gulf of Mexico is the public land. They are the landowner. They're the, the Department of the Interior is the steward. And you have this small cadre of people, dedicated civil servants, with engineering, geological, geophysical backgrounds. And the only way these people can stay up to speed on what's going on in what has been a dramatically evolving industry is to be out in the world, to have interchange with people. One of the things that I spent the time on, um, my role in the, in, on the commission staff, was to look at what's happened since the industry went into deep water. And what I saw, and discovered from talking to many people is that we had a lot of focus in the 90s on these critical deep water production systems. The career staff at the agency came out in 1998, and this was, there was a lot of interchange with the industry on this, in developing these deep water operating plans, very much like a proactive risk-based safety case that we hear about in other regimes, other peer regulatory environments. We haven't had problems there. I mean, there have been some structural issues with a few facilities, but you know, those are the sort of things that everybody knew would happen, and they were very mindful. Some of the things that I've seen that you haven't, that hasn't been in the public, is that the career staff recognized that they felt like they'd focused on the production, that was the right thing, but the reality is they didn't have the resources to expand their capacity. And one of the things we focus on in the, in the report is the budget. And one of the challenges, and Director Bromwich I know will speak to this, is the fact that the agency, in order to be um, conversant and to understand the different risks and the different aspects of these systems that are being put in place, or just the challenges of the exploratory drilling, they have to be more conversant on what the industry knows. One of the things I looked at was the active participation of the career staff in the SPE meetings, the Offshore Technology Conference. You go back to the 90s and you see a lot of joint papers authored between MMS staff, academics, people in industry. You get to the last 10 years, hardly anything. I had some of the industry associations tell me that you know, they used to see a lot of the MMS staff at um, their technical workshops, at their training classes. They reduced the fees for government employees and they weren't able to participate. So basically that's a long way of saying what we need and what the public needs to know is that they've got a regulator, that they've got a federal government that's up to the challenge. And I think there are an awful lot of people there on the staff now that want to be up to the challenge. They want the opportunity to get it back up to, to where they were before. They need to bring in more people because these challenges in deep water are much greater. As we all know, you heard earlier today and you'll hear in much more detail later today, the greater complexities in deep water and ultra deep water. And that means that now that we're headed back into a severe budget environment, we have to recognize that this cannot be just another agency that gets a level budget, that just gets you know, stuck at a certain point saying this is what, you know, this is what the, the taxpayer can pay for. The industry and the public has to recognize that where there's economic activity that poses these challenges, we have to step up to that and we have to source it, resource it appropriately. And I think if we do that, that will do an awful lot to re restore the public's confidence in the agency and in the agency's ability to, um, to protect the public interest with offshore development. Yeah, and I'll add on to the, the two pieces that I see from the public perception again is, is I'll go back. Um, one is I think that there are lines and areas that you need to take a look at what the public wants in some of these deep water drilling environments. Um, in the Northern Gulf, the Western Gulf, oil is accepted. It's part of it. The Eastern Gulf in Florida, it's not desired. In the Arctic, there is a whole new series of challenges and issues that are there that those individuals and persons may not desire. So on the front end of the process, I think that what's paramount is engaging the public participation in the process in the regions and the areas where we're going to want to be. But then also ensuring that there's a process and a transparency in that so that 
the process can work its way forward as it moves through the regulatory component pieces. And I, at the Ocean Conservancy, I mean, many of the changes that have taken place at Interior um, and in Bomer, splitting off sections to create new sections, I think are moving in that direction pretty aggressively from a federal perspective. I think the changes are being rapid. I think they're listening and hearing what's going on. I think the other thing, though, that's, that's really important, following up on, on the point here, is that we can do all that that we want, but it has, we have to be able to fund, that there has to be funding and resources to make sure that those regulators and that relationship can be there and that the technology to drill and the exploration technology is rapidly proceeding out in advance. The regulatory staff need to be able to stay up to speed on that, but at the same point in time, if the, aid, the industry should also be willing to put in an effort and show to the public their planning and response capacity. Once you get to a blowout, a Macondo, a, a large catastrophic event, you're too late. It, there, there needs to be planning and response in place and then a testing and running of those projects, uh, those response plans, not just with, with, with BOMER, but with USCG, with the state agencies, with response agencies. And there's models out there that possibly look at including locals and local hires in the planning process so you can mitigate. I think that bottom point is transparency, including the public and ensuring that our regulatory system and, and the agency and the industry are working together, but that they're stepped away enough that they can, they can achieve the goal. Um, each of you have alluded to an appropriate regulatory um, infrastructure, but that's kind of an amorphous terminology, really, and could mean different things to a lot of different people. So uh, I guess what I'd like to ask, given the fact, you know, especially given Robin's presentation this morning, where we actually saw that you know, we can pretty much rely on the fact that not just in the U.S., but globally, we'll be relying more and more on deep water resources. Um, so this is not just a U.S.-centric issue in a broad sense, right? Um, are there any lessons we can learn from uh, other countries in terms of regulatory infrastructures? Are there, um, uh, are there any takeaways from the lessons that we've seen or the, or the mistakes that we've seen made, not only here but also abroad? And, and are those actually being incorporated? And, and I guess finally, what is the appropriate level of regulation? We, um, we have a heavily regulated society, not just in this industry. And it is, it is part of the fabric of our lives. It's what we've come to expect as a, a public, but also I think industry is um, certainly cognizant that it will be regulated in all sectors um, forever. In terms of um, one of the references made earlier to looking to other parts of the world and the talk that there has been about should we look to the um, making of a safety case the way has been done in the North Sea, particularly in the UK, that is certainly one option. But the difficulty with putting that sort of an option in place is that it could become static and just be on the paper and not be something that is really internalized within the management of the companies that are working in the deep water. And that's what, what we're going to have to have is that, that the, the safety culture be permeating the service industry as well as uh, the operators in the offshore. And one of the things that, that would be very useful is for those who work around the world, who work globally, to be looking in, at putting the same standards in place when they operate in Africa or Brazil or the United States or the North Sea, so that all of the people who work in those areas are trained to those standards, and they don't get trained to different standards in different places, but they have as high a level of standard as is necessary to achieve what I think is, is the objective of industry, and that is no accidents zero accidents. Well, I think you need to, you know, once again, look at some of the, the data that's available. And what the data tells us is that the same companies that operate in the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea and, and other places around the world, that there are higher incident rates and fatality rates in the Gulf of Mexico 
um, for the same operation. So I think that gets us to this question of, well, what, what is it about the operations in the Gulf of Mexico that have, have brought us to that, to, to that point? And I know the National Oil Spill Commission, in, in their, in their uh, report to the president, they came to the conclusion that it's really the collaboration between the regulators and, and the industry is different here. And I think that is what needs to change. And the industry, I think, has shown us in other parts of the world that it can operate um, in, in a safer manner. Now that said, you know, I think it's too easy to sort of say, well, you know, MMS didn't do a good job regulating and things were sort of the Wild West in the Gulf of Mexico and everything was better elsewhere. I'm not sure that's exactly the case and I don't think the data really shows that. But I think we, we need to really look at why it is that the same companies and the same drilling contractors operating in other parts of the world had much um, better safety records than in the Gulf of Mexico. And I think the answer ultimately comes back to the relationship between the regulator and the companies in the Gulf of Mexico. And that needs to, I, I think it's inevitable. I think everyone agrees that, that that has to change significantly. I think we have to start from, the, the answer shouldn't be, well, now that we have this, we need more regulation. I think we need better regulation. Uh, and I think you have to have a starting point that just because you have something, we just if we add something more, it's going to be safer. You get things that are in conflict with one another, that are redundant, that are very burdensome. And you know, somebody said earlier, capital is a coward. And we get to a point where it is so burdensome to do business in the Gulf that people will go elsewhere. There are ample opportunities. Equatorial Guinea, Brazil, they're not too far away. We're seeing rigs go there now, and they're, they're not coming back. So we have to be very thoughtful about this, and it's not more is better. Uh, in this case. Secondly, I think that in the regulatory you know, process that we're going, we should not be overly prescriptive. Uh, and by that, that sounds like I want to be lax, and that's not what I mean. I think we have to recognize the scale and pace of technology, which is what, you know, the, the technology for, in deep water has changed since Macondo. I mean, a scant night, you know, since April, uh, because industry has had a dedicated effort on addressing some issues that, uh, you know, had not necessarily been addressed before. And so we have to make it in such a way that we can accommodate uh, excellence, if that makes any sense. So if you regulate to, a, to, the, to the basement level, you never get to the, you know, the, the second and third stories. We want to make sure that we are always promoting excellence. And so the regulatory structure has to recognize we're mitigating against risk, but we're not holding back on, on advancement. <coughs> I'm going to ask a, a follow on to that because I think that's a very good point you just raised. And I think we also raised. have to recognize, uh, Robin pointed out earlier, that 60% of the players in the Gulf are big guys, uh, but that means 40% are not. And so that we can't have a structure in place that we put 40% of the people in the Gulf out of business overnight, that they can't comply. So we have to recognize that some of the most pioneering companies are the ones that who would have their annual Christmas party in this room and it would be a third full. And so we have to recognize that there's a whole broad variety of companies that we have to be, uh, so it can't be all about money and profits and, and, and redundant capacity. Uh, and so I think we, that, that's why it makes it hard. Somebody said earlier, this is very complex. It is very complex. Uh, but it has to be done with the way that we recognize the reality of the Gulf in terms of the different players, the technology, and overly, uh, over, you know, and that we do this smartly, just not with more regulation. Is there a role for regulation then um, in, in, in an industry that's incredibly competitive to ensure that best practice technology or best available technology is available and being used by all operators in the Gulf? Well, you know, we should immediately look to a great example, uh, the nuclear industry. Uh, the nuclear industry knows that with a single accident, uh, it basically puts the industry out of business. And in the wake of Three Mile Island, they had their wake-up call. They got together and they have, uh, for lack of a better term, I mean, they are not self-regulated by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is the official regulator, but they have a, a peer industry group that not only shares best practices, but they judge each other every year. And if you don't meet the bar, I mean, you're sort of, you know, you have the dunce cap on that year. Uh, and it's, it's a little more structured than that, but it is a very strict, very strictly enforced and very high expectation group that they raise the bar every year. If you got an A in 2011, that's where you start from for 2012 in the grading. You have to do more to get an A in 2012. And that's really where we, I think we need to be is we need to continue to push those best practices to be adopted so that we actually have everybody, all, everybody's collective futures you know, rise together. I think the nuclear industry provides an excellent example for where we need to be going. Um, at the risk of filibustering this whole panel, um, I do have to respond to a couple of comments here. 
on Carol's point about the reference to the safety case, I can tell you we had a lot of discussion about that. That's a term of art used in the UK and Australia. Um, Norway, Maritime Canada, other governments, other environments have an approach that's very risk-based. And that's the concept behind the safety case. The International Association of Drilling Contractors started calling their model the safety case when they testified before the Congress, so that was sort of adapted. But the, the key here is to look at whatever the activity is. If it's exploratory drilling in an area that's pretty well known, that's, say, the shallow water gulf, well-defined um, province, there, there's a risk profile associated with it. If it's, you know, the far reaches of ultra deep water, the first exploratory, well, that's different. If it's a new production system, there are different hazards associated with it. And that's where, and, and adding on to what Karen said, you can't just have one size fits all for everything. And there is a danger here too with, with prescriptive regulations. That's one of the reasons why after some of the terrible experiences in the North Sea, in Norway, the UK, and Maritime Canada, they all had terrible fatalities and accidents that occurred in the decade of the 1980s. And they went from a prescriptive only or prescriptive primarily approach to one that then required, they have baseline regs, the things that everybody knows about, they know you need to do this because we've learned from experience how to prevent fires, explosions, et cetera. Okay, that, those are the prescript, prescriptive baseline regs. But then you have to go beyond that specific to whatever the, the operation or environment is. And the thing that became apparent to us in looking at the United States, because the president said not just look at the deep water horizon and what happened here, but offshore drilling in the future in the US. And I came to the conclusion personally that we have at least four different environments in the US, which is unusual in the world. I mean, we're unique in this. We've got the shallow water gulf, we've got the shelf, we've got the deep and ultra deep water, and they really are two different environments. And then we have California, and there are different circumstances associated with the production out there, different dangers associated with it. And then we have the Arctic. And we can't have a regulator that takes a one-size-fits-all approach. On the issue of whether we regulate too much and whether we have the right type of regulatory regime, it's interesting when we got into this and started looking more closely at it, and I have to thank Robin West and, and his folks for some of the, the work that they provided to us in the early days here of looking at how others have, have approached this. Um, DNV and, and some others did some comparisons of the MMS regulations versus Norway, the UK, and in fact, in some cases, our regs are less prescriptive than they are in those environments. And they forget to even mention some of their prescriptive part of the regs because they just assume, well, that's a baseline. Of course, you have to have that. So we have an environment where we need to reassess the regs. And I think there's, that process has been going on. And we have to give this agency an awful lot of credit. They've really stepped up. They're in a process. They're working with industry. They're looking at you know, how they need to change the existing regs. They're very cautious, and Director Bromwich has said, we need to be careful about not putting things into statute that apply across the board. At the same time, one of the experiences and lessons from the Monterra uh, blowout in Australia was that the movement toward too much sort of risk-based, performance-based regulation went too far in that the regulations did not require adequate barriers in that case. And that we do need to have these baseline prescriptive regulations that, that should be um, applied in all circumstances. So the question of determining which ones fall into that category, which fall elsewhere, is a challenge for the regulator and the industry and recognizing the different environments. And on the issue of international standards, that's something that I think we're, we're in a different age now than we were, say, 10 or 15 years ago as the industry started going out into deep water, where it is easier to share information. And one of the things we discovered is there wasn't a lot of information sharing. And if you read the commission report, you'll see that one of the Transocean rigs had a very similar experience with another company in the North Sea months before the Macondo well. The Montero blowout and spill occurred, what, six months, eight, seven months earlier in Australia, again, in an international industry. So one, there's the challenge for the industry to share information, for regulators to share information, and for everyone to look at what are truly the best practices. And I think the, the International Regulators Forum, which the US was one of the founders of, Norway, the UK, Brazil, 
a number of others, and including the World Bank now, um, received uh, calls from a number of the West African countries seeking support to develop and to understand what truly are best practices so that they can know what types of regimes to have in, in those countries because they, the concern is they can't just rely on, on the international oil companies given these last two, two major spills. So the idea is raise the bar across the board, but it means greater analysis of, of what's happened both within the industry and on the part of regulators collectively in an international industry. Yeah, and, I, and what I would say, that, that what I'm hearing, the theme that runs through this is, is one of the focuses of the Ocean Conservancy here is that the, the issue is, is, yes, you want to use best practices. Yes, there's the, the world is shrinking and we're in a global market now. But I think that as they start to look into that, I think we need to be looking at a much more science-based front-end approach to determining where are the environmentally sensitive areas. What, it's not just the drilling component piece, it's about the ecosystem components, the ecology, as Dr. Thornhill talked about earlier, and also the interface between the human elements. So I think that if we would put a little bit more front end focus and look at the science-based the science proce processes of what would be needed in each of these deep water environments, utilize that plus taking the best model practices that we have, we could create some standards that would work but I think that at the end of the day, again, like you were saying, the, the point here is, is making sure that we've got plans and processes in place that can be adaptive to each one of these times that they're gonna take place. Um, so I would just say that we need to stick with the science-based approach to find out how that is and use that on the front end, but then also be constantly reevaluating. We may find that the best practice models, like the nuclear example, every year you need to, you need to step up and reassert that you're ready to do that um, there may be a better practice that gets put in place. And certainly we should be sharing that information with some of the developing areas or the areas that we're going to be moving to, because I think that for most of the people that are in this room, we would like to maintain that Ameri those, those jobs here and export some of that opportunity out. Um, this will probably be a quick question for each of you, I hope. Um, but uh, you know, if you look across individual companies that are operating in the Gulf, and compare their safety records, there are obvious differences. And I know that there's a panel later today that's going to address this issue, but I just want to get your thoughts on this because I think it pertains very, it's very relevant to the question, what is the appropriate level of regulation? How do you promote a safety culture across industry that is proven to be effective within one particular company that may not be apparent in others? Is there a way to actually do that without extensive government involvement? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab, and I'm not going to say you're good, you're bad, you know, here's your grade, but I, I think we have to, I don't think we want government in the boardroom of saying, here's what your corporate culture will be. I think a good corporate culture, a good safety culture, re you're rewarded in new business, new leases, good revenue, uh, et cetera. And so I think it starts at the very top, but I don't think it's a place where government says, this is what you must look like. I mean, that's where the regulatory thing, because it says, we're not going to tell you what kind of company you're going to be, but here's the, here's the expectations that you have to meet or exceed. And I think that's the balance. I mean, we have, you know, you look at the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, you have all different flavors and approaches. Uh, but I also have to think we, we have to recognize that many of these companies uh, you know, we, we are, are multinational companies. They're operating in Brazil, Equatorial Guinea, Nigeria. They're operating in all many different parts of the world. And they have to operate, and many of them do, to the highest level. Uh, and so while the, the expectations and the level might be higher in one country than another, they're going to accept the highest level and operate that level. And I think that's where we should be concentrating our efforts is everybody operating, you know, at the, at the highest level uh, of safety. Uh, but I don't think, I think we would, we would be very, uh, we would do ourselves a disservice if we uh, invite, you know, government into the boardroom. I, I, one of the, the things I think we are looking at in our country is, and the, the president has, uh, you know, inst has uh, announced a regulatory review because there are lots of mundane and burdensome regulations on the table. And I go back to smart regulation, not management, not government management. Uh, and we also have to recognize against whom these companies are competing. Uh, the Chinese National Oil Company, which is significantly larger than even ExxonMobil, has a very different relationship with its government and different management practice and different expectations than our other companies. And when they are going to compete for a lease in a certain country, they have a comparative advantage. They can overbid. 
uh, because they don't necessarily have that profit motivation uh, that other companies have that are dependent upon shareholders. So we also have to be cognizant of the risks and the competitive environment that our companies are in, and I think that's sort of lost. You know, it's not Chevron versus Exxon. It's these, set, these small set of companies that are operating against you know, the Chinese National Oil Company, Rosneft, companies that have very different cultures, very different expectations, and incredibly different business models. And that puts the companies that we like to see and have our values at a distinct disadvantage in many places around the world. And we certainly wouldn't want to put them at an even bigger disadvantage here. Well, I wouldn't disagree with anything that Karen just said. Um, I would. Um, put a little different perspective on it. Um, one of the things that I found out in talking to a number of people in industry, and not just the operators, but the contractors and the subcontractors in the U.S. and internationally, um, and I did spend a lot of time talking to the international regulators and um, people that, that work in different parts of the world, and one of the things that's difficult in this environment when you have some large companies that control so much of the activity. Right now things are booming, you know, companies can get jobs. The concern is for a lot of these contractors that they need to be able to, you know, be called back and to continue to work with these companies. And what some countries have learned is that the drilling rigs, actually the rig operators have gone and asked for separate certification. In fact, the Norwegian regulator has spoken about this quite at length, if you aren't aware of that history, because some of the rigs felt like they were challenged with some of the operators who didn't want to hold the standards that they knew to be the case in that particular environment, whatever the regulatory regime is. So in part, it, it is definitely most so safety culture is driven clearly mostly by the company, but secondly by the regulatory regime and how much the regime insists on that. And one of the things that we haven't talked about and hasn't, has really kind of been lost in this whole discussion of what's happened here and the, the, the change that I'm afraid we may not make, and that has to do with the fact that we too had too many regulatory agencies involved in policing the offshore, if you will. Um, the Coast Guard had responsibility for workplace safety on drilling rigs and initially on all offshore facilities, vessels as well as offshore platforms. And by law, technically they do. Over the course of years, because of lack of resources, they, through memoranda of agreement, transferred a lot of that responsibility over onto MMS. Now, they took it on just because they realized it wasn't being done by the Coast Guard. They got no additional resources for this. And one of the things that Russ mentioned about the safety record offshore, it's not so much process safety. I mean, these, the fatalities and the high injury rates that we see are not because of you know, the deep water horizon type incidents, but just lack of care, if you will, relative to some of these other regimes. By that, I mean the North Sea, Canada, Australia. And in that case, it's a different situation. But the bottom line is, we don't have a single offshore regulator that focuses on safety. And what, what happened in, the Nor in Norway, the UK, and in fact just came out of the Montero situation in Australia, is that you need to have one authority responsible for ensuring the safety of all these contractors. When you, when you think about a production platform, you clearly have the operator in charge. When you look at a drilling rig like the Deepwater Horizon, the vast majority, over 80% of the people on the rig at any one time were not BP employees. In fact, most of them were transocean, but there were, I think at the time of the explosion, there were maybe a people from a dozen different companies on that rig. And I don't want to go into great detail on this, but the, there is the fact that you've got to have a regulator that's committed to safety culture. And one of the things that we discovered and the conclusion, conclusion the commission came to here is that you need to have a distinct entity responsible for the safety. I mean, we kind of looked at MMS as having geologists, biologists, and then the engineers, and they were all in this one mix. And so the reason that they've separated it out, and, and we think that they have in what Director Bromwich and Secretary Salazar announced, as a separation where you have the, the leasing entity and the, and the biologists and the environmental uh, um, scientists that are going to be doing all the NEPA work as you look at the areas where we should be developing or what special cautions there should be in those areas that we're going to lease. But then you need to have this separate office over here 
that really looks at the safety, the integrity of the operations, those facilities, whatever activities occur, and the people. That's the other side of this, because the bottom line is in these complex operations, the safety and the safety culture is driven by the people. It's not the technology or the equipment. And so you need that um, counterpoint from the government perspective. Yeah, and my, my only, I, I don't think anybody was advocating, I, I haven't heard people talking about being in the boardroom, but one of the problems here was a communication failure. It was a communication failure between the subs and making sure who knew what and when and how. I think that there should be minimum technology advancements that it was in the report. You know, there could have been things that would have put on that would have automatically sh implemented plans to shut down the well, as opposed to somebody having to look to hit a button. Um, that said, the communication and the coordination between the contractors and the subs and all the different elements, that needs to be something that's known by everyone and then there needs to be a regulator that's signing off on that. There also, however, needs to be at a certain time, I think annually, at a certain point in time, people looking at the safety and efficacy of the plan and the operation as it results to the natural resources and the environment where they're working in. No one knew in the front end of this thing that it was going to shut down the coast of Louisiana and cause billions of dollars worth of damage and that is still causing problems today. Um, that is not a boardroom decision. But at the end of the day, there needs to be a review and a process in place to ensure that the regional economies and the coastal economies that are close and working and that are supplying those workers that are going out to those rigs have an ability to make sure that those safety cultures aren't just for the people and the persons, but for the environment and the areas where they're going to be working in so that we have long-term sustainability. Um, my training says as an economist. I, I see safety and a, a clear, clean safety culture that's transparent, and, that's transparent and available and known as promoting what a business wants, which is knowing the long-term profitability of their operations. That, I think, is something that can be done. I think with technology changing, it can take place a lot more efficiently. I would like to say that, that it would not be good to have the government in the boardrooms, but I think that if you look at the new safety rule that has come out um, in the last couple of months, you see a, a very significant development in that the regulations now are looking much more toward the prevention of the, the, uh, the low risk, but the very high consequence type of accident. And looking at putting in place and taking the, rec the recommended practices from API and codifying those in the regulations so that the companies will be putting into place systems that should lead to a um, much higher level of safety, but not the personal worker safety, which I think people have known how to do and they've really stressed in, in all different parts of the offshore industry, but rather into the systems of the operations themselves so that you have written procedures and so that those are tested and so that you have management of change procedures and the kinds of things that, that really come out of the uh, process safety side of the business rather than the worker safety side. But I would go back just to answer your specific question, Ken, to what I said in an earlier answer, which is this has to be inculcated not just at the boardroom, not just at the CEO level, but it's got to go down through the ranks and be very much a part of the fabric of middle management so that their expectations of their people below are clearly set and reinforced constantly that the procedures and the personal safety has to always be uppermost in, in the conduct of the business. Uh, just real quickly, I, I would agree with what you just said. I, I, it clearly needs to be, if you look at the different companies, and I've done some reporting on this, some companies really walk the walk a lot better than others. You brought up management of change, which is a key safety and risk um, uh, tool. There was plenty of management of change in BOP. They just didn't do it effectively on Macondo, and I think that's come out. So, you know, the question is, it's not just about having the procedures in place, but making sure that there's a company buy-in and that everyone accepts it and has bought into it and, and understands that their performance and their pay raise at the end of the year is all predicated in part upon how they're following those type of procedures. So. 
I just wanted to go back to this distinction between process safety and personal safety. Um, we were careful during the course of the discussion about this to really focus on process safety because that was the failure here at, at the Deepwater Horizon. The personal safety issue, though, we do have a problem in the United States. The statistics are not good compared to the other peer regulators. And I think, as, as Carol pointed out, and when you look at some of these companies, the major companies, you'll see that they really they do have good safety records. Um, but that's not true across the Gulf. And the fact that we don't have one single unified safety regulator is a recognized challenge. And in fact, in an early meeting I had with some of the staff of the MMS, they basically said, yeah, we're kind of left you know, trying to fill in the gaps here. I mean, OSHA doesn't have a role. The Coast Guard uh, basically pushed off a lot of that responsibility that they were charged with because they didn't have the resources. So yes, this was not a, a personal safety challenge, but the reality is we have a problem with personal injury rates and we just put out a staff paper here this week. If you want to look at this, you'll see a lot more detail in there from the statistics we see from the industry associations, from the International Association of Drilling Contractors and the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. Relative to the fatality rates, and we have a higher fatality rate per hours worked in the, in the Gulf um, than the North Sea and, and Australia, but uh, we have a lower injury rate reported to the regulator. That, that ratio doesn't hold when you look at what shows up in the industry statistics. So again, that raises a, an issue and a real question in my mind, and the commissioners have brought this up, it's not, that th there's, there's a risk here for people who work for contractors and subcontractors. Everybody reports through the operator. The federal government, the MMS, does not have a direct relationship, not, not a very strong relationship with the drilling rigs and any of these contractors. The rigs are under the jurisdiction of the Coast Guard for the most part as vessels. And so we have this sort of, you know, never, never land out there for an awful lot of people that work offshore. And there are, there are major oil companies that we know have very strong safety cultures, and I don't think those are the places where there's the big challenge. But the drilling rigs and that environment where you have so many people on and off, and then these smaller operations. And a lot of the, the danger, most dangerous work offshore, obviously, is, is it's in maintenance and in decommissioning, and that's where we see a lot of the problems. And I, I don't want to let that drop, because we were, you know, we want to draw that distinction, but not lose the issue. <clears throat> Thank you. I've actually received a lot of questions, and a lot of them are very good. I'm trying to weave the questions through what a lot of you are asking. Um, may not have done a great job, but I'm sure the panelists would uh, love to talk to you about your specific concern uh, after the session. Um, I'm going to end on one final question I'd like to get you all to address. And it really late, relates back to the uh, whether or not we have sort of a static or a dynamic, you know, prescriptive regulation. Um, and tied into that is, you know, how do we respond in case there is an accident? Um, what role is there for regulation to actually address that? Um, and in terms of accident prevention and even um, accident response. How does the federal government fit into the R&D picture with regard to that particular issue? So, Carol? Well, that was a lot of questions. Well, it's, all yeah, they're all related. I mean, that's, I was trying to <laughs> yes. plant lots of seeds. I well, guess. I'll leave, I'll leave um, the R&D question perhaps for someone else to, to answer, but I do think that as we have talked throughout the, the panel comments that there is a role for prescriptive regulation, but there, that's just not the whole answer. And I think that we need to be looking much beyond that and be looking for continuous improvement that really is driven by the companies themselves who know what their developing technology is and who know what, what their capabilities are becoming, not just what they were five years ago. And I think that, that that's where having the regulators work with the industry groups and, and be very attuned to where the technology is going and learning from the recommended practices as they have done over the past year and putting those where they make uh, a good fit into the regulations themselves is very much what's going to, um, to shape 
the best types of regulatory programs and government and industry collaboration, which at the end of the day, I think is, is something that we need to make sure is encouraged and is, is um, continued forward in a very strong way. Uh, just to repeat something I think has been said earlier, um, the technology had changed so fast and was so advanced <laughs> that the government regulators um, were simply not able to stand toe to toe and I, and I don't think they are today. There's, there's issues of, of, as Shirley's brought up, of funding, of, of hiring people who, who can, can engage with and understand technologies that, that is um, comparable to sending people to the moon in many cases. Um, and so, you know, and I, I think the other issue that really needs to be addressed here is that, you know, there's a lot of been a lot of talk that I've heard about partnerships. And one of the obvious partners here is the API, the American Petroleum Institute. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the issues is the API serves a dual role right now. They're very involved in regulations and promulgating best practices. They're also the lobbyists. Um, and I think that, that issue really needs to be addressed because it's difficult for me as an observer to understand how, how they can do both effectively. Um, and I think that in the partnership between the industry and the companies um, and, and the API, th that's an issue that still needs to be addressed going forward. You know, I think we focused on a very narrow part of the regulatory question. So let me just in a minute try and step back and look at the broader thing. Because when we say regulation, we've been talking about safety. We've been talking about things, obviously, hugely important things. But what is the regulatory environment for investing in offshore in the United States? I mean, it starts with, okay, what is whatever administration is about? What's their policy? Are they for it? Or are they against it? And then it goes to, okay, uh, then are we going to have opportunities to actually access uh, new resources? So that goes to the Department of Interior's five-year leasing plan so that they know that they've actually got investment opportunity because these companies, any company, is not looking at a five-year time horizon. They're looking at a 20, 30, 40, 50-year time horizon. So they've got to figure out, are we going to have a long-term you know, staying ability in whatever region it is? We're talking about the Gulf, so it starts there. And then you get into what are the you know, expectations in terms of safety. And then when they have to sit down and do their business models, what's the fiscal environment going to be? You know, what's my, what are my taxes going to be? What's the royalty revenue I'm going to have to pay? What's, what, what is all of that? And they have to put that all together and figure out of whether the, the access, uh, the fiscal environment, and the compliance actually come together in something that they can be successful in. And so it's a much bigger, broader, more complex question that involves actually more like 18 or 19 federal agencies and state agencies they're dealing with. It's not just the Department of Interior or the Coast Guard. It's EPA. I mean, it, it's massive at the, at the federal and, and, and local level, and it takes many years to go through this process. So there's a, a very you know, deliberative process and what we are doing, we are going to change the regulatory environment in such a way that we will clearly understand the expectations uh, on the safety side and the oversight side. Uh, there are going to be new expectations on the response capability and industry is stepping forward and, and demonstrating how they are going to be able to respond. But government also has an obligation not to change the rules of the game every two years. And while it sounds like I'm contradicting myself, while we want some ability to have dynamic regulations to involve technology advancements, we also don't want to say, you know, next year we're going to change the tax structure because all of a sudden your business model of 50 years just went out the window. And so we have to be careful about providing an era of a, a regulatory environment that is certain. We need some certainty so that we can actually invite investment into the Gulf, into Alaska, into other areas, rather than, you know, many boards of directors are sitting there saying, should we put our money into the Gulf or should we be going to fill in the blank, Equatorial Guinea, Brazil, et cetera. They're making those decisions because right now, believe it or not, there's more opportunity than there is capital. Uh, and so is the Gulf a destination for investment or not? And we have to consider that in the whole regulatory environment, not just about safety, but it, the fiscal environment, the policy, the leasing plan, you know, as we look forward that this is a much more interconnected uh, effort uh, that needs to be looked after in that way. That obviously has to be balanced, it has to have heavy environmental concerns represented, but we have to look at the entire chain of regulatory decisions that are regulatory uh, uh, issues that a company has to navigate and mitigate against. Certainly, and I, I think maybe what you're getting at is, is a concern that I've actually seen on many of these cards uh, that have been sent forward. Um, will the new uh, regulatory infrastructure be burdensome to the point it actually causes capital to flee from the Gulf of Mexico? Um, and I think it's a question that's burning on a lot of people's minds, and I'm not sure that any of us can actually, actually answer that right now. Um, but it's uh, uh, something I'd like to maybe have Shirley address a little bit, so.
Well, maybe this is a rhetorical question from my perspective, but what has the agency done in the way of, of new regulations that most of the companies haven't said they were doing anyway? I mean, this big safety rule that just came out requiring everyone to have a safety environmental management plan so that they're coordinating their activities is something that had been voluntary since the 90s. Um, I can't tell you how many companies came in and told us about their plans, how it worked, how they'd been improving it over the years. Um, there are other things that were uh, issued that are more you know, direct prescriptive regs that I, I haven't heard anyone complain about. I think that what happened here, and let's go back again to you know, what I mentioned earlier that, and, and we did see this, I'm not gonna go through the trail, my Democratic colleagues from the Hill did a good job of that, of pointing out every little regulation that was issued you know, over the last 15 years and where the Gulf of Mexico got more deals and things were removed. And that, that isn't the case, but the re I'm not gonna speak to any of that. I mean, there's, we have a situation where clearly there were some issues that were not being adequately addressed under federal law and the, the current director is now trying to make sure that they're checking all the boxes, that they're going through the processes that they have to, to make sure they don't get sued. Um, when they go to issue permits. And in fact, there are some reports today that um, some environmentalists are thinking about bringing some suits for deep water permits over marine mammal permits. So, you know, there are those challenges under federal law. And I think as a lot of people know, it hasn't been said out loud at this meeting, but the environmental community and a lot of people viewed the Gulf of Mexico as a sacrifice zone. You know, when the moratoria came in in 1990 and we basically settled everything down to pretty much the, the Gulf of Mexico, you know, a lot of the pressure went away and there wasn't as much attention. Now, I think as, as I heard Director Bromwich say pretty recently, and I think the companies are starting to, to see this as well too, that we're gonna get back to a new normal. There may be you know, more process involved in it. There'll be more you know, focus on what needs to happen from an environmental standpoint, especially up front. But then once you do get the permits, you'll be able to go forward in a modern, developed environment. On the R&D piece, let me just speak to that quickly because I do work for the Department of Energy and Secretary Chu. I think he's spoken to that um, in a number of discussions with the commission and other places as has um, uh, Dr. Hunter, who's just been appointed to this new federal advisory committee on offshore uh, technology. And that is that the industry really became extremely sophisticated and made dramatic advances in technology to exploit resources. But some of the equipment is really vintage in some of its instrumentation and control systems. And so there is an existing program that's funded with some, some federal royalties that can be repurposed to that. And the commission's recommended, and I think there'll be support for some funding for oil spill response, R&D. But clearly there is a joint role for both the federal government to make sure that it's moving along and that the experiences of other industries are being brought to bear and applied to this industry. That was one of the interesting things that Secretary Chu and some of the scientists that got involved pointed out, well, there are all sorts of things that we're doing over here. They should have been doing them there. So there is a joint role, but recognizing that the federal government's resources are gonna be limited is, is the, the challenge. Yeah, and my, my, my lot, real quickly, I know we're closing off here, would be that I, I would just say that the R&D component, as we move into exploration, there should be a, a, a proportional insurance of the, of the safety regulations and, and the need for doing that. And that there's also gonna be a need over time to utilize the expertise of the agencies on the front end of these processes to look at things like marine mammal, use Fish and Wildlife Service, use NOAA, use the Coast Guard, use the national response plans that we use when hurricanes hit in the Gulf that can trigger more quick proactive response to potential events and, and tabletop exercises to make sure that if something does happen, we can contain it and shut it down more, more effectively and quickly. On that note, Shirley mentioned boxes. Uh, we have box lunches across the way, uh, and so we'll go across there. We'll come back at uh, 1.15 uh, for Director Bromwich, but I really want to thank the panel because I thought this was a terrific discussion.